All right, welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. I'm here with Leonard Heim. Leonard, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, as you said, my name is Leonard Heim. I'm a researcher at the Center for the Governance of AI, in short, GovAI, that's what we usually say. Um, GovAI's mission is like roughly, we're trying to build like a global research community where we're trying to help humanity to navigate this transition to advanced AI, I think the thing which might have seen over the last few weeks. And what I'm mostly doing, I'm working on this research stream, which we call compute governance. So I'm thinking about computational infrastructure. I'm particularly interested just like, is computer promising node of AI governance? What are like the sub nodes of compute we can use to achieve beneficial AI outcomes? What are hard enabled mechanisms we can use to support these regimes? So like everything compute in general, but over time this became more narrow. My background is in hardware engineering. So I studied compute engineering in school spend a lot of time actually figuring out how computers work. And now I'm trying to build on top of this knowledge, trying to yeah use compute to steer towards more beneficial AI outcomes. Fantastic. All right. So what I imagine I was talking about here is how we can forecast AI progress specifically by looking at, at compute. But perhaps, uh, I mean, before we get there, we should probably introduce the key factors that's driving AI progress, which you call the AI triad. Um, what, what is the AI triad and, and what are the factors involved here? AI triad, three factors. I think another way how to think about this, I think is which like sometimes useful concept is we can also call it the AI production function. You know, it's a function where we have certain inputs and we have certain outputs and questions like what are these inputs? And one way how to think about the inputs is like to split it up into three components, which we describe as algorithms, data, and compute. What do we mean with algorithms? Well, when we think about AI nowadays, we mostly talk about machine learning. Within machine learning, we talk about deep learning. And even within there, you can go too deeper to like the specifics of these algorithms, be it the transformer architectures, how do you train these systems, all these kinds of things. They're all important for the eventual output. The next thing is the data, right? Those systems, as we do machine learning, we have some kind of learning, so we give them some data on which they should learn on. Um, this is nowadays like big data sets, be it text, be it images, whatever we're training these systems on. Um, which is another input, right? And lastly, then we have the factor which actually enables all of this, which is compute or computational infrastructure. Um, this is eventually the system, this physical infrastructure we need to then train these systems and also later like to execute them. Um, sometimes people also think about talent as another factor there. I usually would describe it as a secondary input. You know, talent helps with better algorithms, maybe acquiring more data, maybe making compute better. But like, if you think about like, yeah, those three are like fundamental to like break them down think about like, how much do they matter for AI progress? What is the output there and how have they developed over time? Does it make sense to separate these factors and talk about how much each factor contributes to AI progress? Or is it simply so interrelated that it doesn't make sense to, to separate, uh, separate them out like that? Yeah, that's definitely an ongoing question. I think it makes sense trying to separate them, right? I'm like, I'm claiming I do compute governance. And I think maybe in the future, people will be claiming they do algorithm governance or data governance. And again, there are always downsides to put things into boxes, but sometimes there are like some ups to like having these kinds of models. Yeah, if we try to separate them, I think what I've been historically interested in is just like, well, what was their historic role over time? And I think in general, we can say they all trade off with each other, right? If I want to build an AI system, I can just like try to spend a lot of time figuring out the better algorithms, getting more data, or just like throwing more compute at the problem, and eventually will turn out to be like a better AI system with better capabilities. Um, what we've seen over time with, with data is we just acquire more over time. So roughly it doubled, I think it was every 1.4 years. So the amount of data we used, I think this 1.4 years was not for text data. This again would look different for image data, for voice models, but I think text data um, is the thing we're currently thinking about when we talk about large language models. Whereas in contrast, if you think about compute, and what I mean here is like the compute used for training these systems, right? And when I say how much compute we use for training the systems, I refer to how many floating point operations for you needed to train the system that it's eventually finished and it can be run. We did an analysis on this and we roughly saw that, that the training compute is doubling every six months. So this, this is like faster progress, like faster doubling compared to data. And how has this uh, doubling rate evolved over time? So, uh, so has compute always been been doubling every six months, or has it uh, has the rate of doubling also increased over time? Yeah, like when we like we did this investigation on compute, the first ones to do it was like actually in OpenAI. They had a blog post called AI and Compute. They did this, I think, in 2018, 19, something along these lines. And what they found, well, this AI training compute has been doubling every 3.4 months. 
So twice as fast as I just said. So we did we ran the same analysis with just like way more ML systems at the beginning of 2022, added some more new systems like, well, if we now look at the trend, it's actually just doubling every every six months. And this is partially they picked like a cutoff point where just like new systems, like pretty compute intensive systems like AlphaGo and these kinds of systems came out, which yeah, we're like really at the top of this trend and like skewed this whole trend upwards. I think if you would like look at the data right now, which everybody can do, if you just go to epochai.org, um, I think the doubling time would sit somewhere point six point five months or seven months right now. We don't haven't added GPT four yet because nobody told us yet how much compute this is. If we could add GPT four, we might have better insights there. Okay, so if we were to put some numbers on it, how much of AI progress would you say is attributable to compute? Yeah, I, I don't feel like I, I would like to put numbers on it. Maybe maybe you can describe it with like what Richard Sutton calls this bitter lesson, where, where he was saying like, oh, people have been trying to develop new fancy algorithms, trying to learn from the brain. But what we've just historically seen over the last year is basically we just have like search algorithms and we just throw more compute at them, right? And like, of course, I mean, you're talking to a guy who claims he's doing compute governance. So I think it's like an important note. Am I not saying like, oh, 50% of the progress of AI is due to compute or it's 90? I can't tell. There might be more analysis on the futures. That's up for the economists. I'm saying, seems like an important node. I think it has some unique properties independent of how important it is for AI. It has some unique properties, which we can use to yeah, achieve better and beneficial AI outcomes. I think it's important for us to talk a little bit about how modern advanced chips are produced. So perhaps you could talk about you know, where are they produced, how, how difficult is it to produce these chips, uh, who are the key players involved, and so on. Yeah, I think, I think the disclaimer is here. I think chips or integrated circuits are probably the most complex device, product, whatever we as humankind have ever produced. So whatever I say here, take everything with a grain of salt. I'm like trying to explain on like a really high abstraction layer. This is basically an effort of humankind that we have these kinds of chips. It's a global supply chain. What is one way of thinking about it? I think it's like useful to think about like three processes. We can say that's like the design phase where we just think about like, well, how do we actually, we have all of these transistors, we put them somewhere. How do we, how do we put them that it actually does some math, right? I think that's like abstraction layer, which most people actually do not get. Like us talking right now here, everybody having a smartphone just relies on a device, which is like switches and we have trillions or billions on them on a chip. So that's the design phase. Who are people who design these chips? Apple, for example, is designing these chips. They're just like, hey, here's our new M1. A17, whatever they put in their MacBooks or iPhones. Once they've designed such a chip, this is just like some piece of code, like eventually it goes down to like how this chip eventually looks like. Um, we need to fabricate this chip, right? Um, this is where we then etch this chip. Years of history there, how this has been done. I think the important actors to know here is like TSMC, Samsung, and Intel. Those are the ones which are leading the cutting edge chip production. And an important another factor is there. There's the company called ASML, which people might have heard about. This is this obscure company sitting in the Netherlands, which sells the machines to TSMC, Intel, and Samsung, which then produces these chips, right? Then we get our chips out of it. And the last thing we need to do is like we need, need to assemble this chip, we test and package them. This is sometimes done at another provider or it's directly done at the fab, right? So the important thing is like Apple sells these chips, but they're not actually producing them. They're just think about how to design them and then you send it off elsewhere, right? It's kind of if, if you guys think about like, oh, I'm printing a t-shirt for my local, um, I don't know, football club. You're not going to produce it. You're going to send it up to this other per person who's like producing a bunch of t-shirts and then I print your t-shirt with your local thing. That's the same as Apple is doing it. Um, and then eventually you get it back and then you sell these. So like, yeah, the three steps, um, designing, fabrication, and lastly, assembly, testing, and manufacturing. That's the chip supply chain. And what about certain bottlenecks in, in these supply chains? Uh, what would happen, for example, if ASML uh, ceased to exist or the TSMC ceased to exist? How much uh, depends on specific uh, companies here? As I just said, it's a really complex product. It's the effort of like all of, all of us, all of the whole world coming together. So it's a global supply chain, right? Um, I think these explicit examples of ASML and TSMC are interesting. So if we look at ASML, ASML is the only company in the world which, which is producing these EUV machines, which are used for producing cutting edge chips. So if ASML ceases to exist, I think there are going to be like a big shortage and like we're going to take a, probably we're going to hit a recession or something along these lines, right? I mean, we can continue using the machines that currently chip, but we want to keep on going, right? That's like the history of computing. We just keep on pushing, making this chip smaller, smaller and smaller over time. 
ASML is the strongest case where we literally just have one company who's producing these EV machines, right? But even if we then move to the fabrication where we have ASML, Intel, and Samsung for cutting edge chips, TSMC makes like roughly 70 to 80% of the whole revenue in this domain. So TSMC is like the really important actor there, right? Which is producing all of these chips, like all of our iPhones um, and MacBooks and whatever kinds of chips we are using. This might look different for chips which are sitting in your... I don't know, in your dishwasher or in your car, these are usually like older Node chips, which I use. So they wouldn't be hit by ASML directly. But I mean, ASML is also producing the older chips. So we have what people call bottlenecks, or as other people call it also choke points, right? Which I guess we're going to be talking about later at some point, which you can then use to achieve um, certain goals. Yeah, I think that's like roughly the bottlenecks. And just like, it's just really complicated to use it. It just costs a lot of money. There's a limited number of fabs. And it's just really, really, really hard to produce these kinds of chips. So the stories I've heard um, about, yeah, how hard this produces chips and which kind of like obscure things happened, which reduced the yield, like how many good chips you get out of this. Yeah, it's crazy. How far are the nearest competitors behind the, the very uh, cutting edge companies here? I mean, like Intel might be like the interesting case to look at, right? Like who was once leading this and then got overtaken by TSMC. Intel was this company who designed the chips and also produced them and also packaged them, right? They were like doing this across the whole thing. Whereas like at some point, AMD came along to something like revolutionized. It was like, hey, we actually just designed the chips and somebody else is going to be producing them. How much behind are there? I mean, I just said like a TSMC makes up the majority of the share of these cutting edge chips and TSMC is just leading the field there. There are some forecasting questions and it looks like that TSMC and Samsung are going to be achieving three nanometers this year and will start mass producing this. Intel probably won't achieve this, but probably next year. So I guess Intel is like one year behind, but that just describes the, the node, right? The transistor size or like the fabrication process. It does not describe how much they actually produce. And I think there's still a big difference where like TSMC has like way more fabs to just produce way more. For ASML, I guess it's more trickier. Um, I guess a bunch of the other competitors just kind of gave up and they're just hoping like, well, we can, might not be able to produce EV machines, but maybe we can make the next thing after the EV machines, right? Um, I haven't seen good analysis there, like how far the other ones are behind. I guess it's just fair to say it's just really, really hard. And we have like certain countries who are like trying really, really hard right now to produce these kinds of machines to produce the chips, but also like the fabs which produce the chips. And I guess it will be hard for them up to maybe impossible if there's like not new paradigms coming along. Is there an interesting difference between between computer chips in general and the cutting edge uh, computer chips used for specifically AI purposes and in terms of production and supply chain? Or is it simply the same companies leading both chips in general and uh, AI-specific chips? I think it's, it's useful to, to think again about like our three steps. We have the design, we have the fabrication, and the packaging. Um, the design companies are different for AI chips, at least if we think about which AI chips I mostly think about when I think about AI governance, right? So I think about AI chips ending up in data centers, AI accelerators, mostly produced by NVIDIA, with, for example, the A100, H100, are names referred there, but also Google with their TPUs, the tensor processing units, which they only keep in-house. So they are designing them, right? There's some like equivalent to Apple. Apple also has like AI core processors on their smartphone chip or on their laptop, but those are not the chips which I'm talking about when we talk about like training large scale systems, when we talk about training GPT-4, you're not using your smartphone, you're not using your computer there. That's a different use case. So the design phase is different, but actually the fabrication phase is the same. They both send it off to eventually to TSMC or any other, and they're going to be then producing it for you. Um, and the same goes for the packaging process. So if we talk about cutting edge chips, we talk about chips like, yep, they have like the three nanometer chips, they're sitting in your smartphone, they're sitting in your laptop, but they're also sitting in like these AI accelerators, for example, GPUs, which then go to the data centers. The difference is design phase there, right? The chips are like eventually turn out to be physically different. Um, they implement certain functions. For example, like a smartphone is still a general processing unit, a CPU, right? It can do a bunch of stuff. Whereas for AI accelerators, we move along the spectrum more towards more specialized chip, right? It's a specialized chip, which is really, really good at solving parallel problems. What we've learned is that uh, so chip production is extremely advanced and extremely complex. And we've learned that it plays a key role in, in driving AI progress. So let's talk about what we can learn if we try to ex extrapolate uh, progress in compute and find out what this can tell us about progress in AI in general. So this is what you might refer to as AI timeline forecasting, just uh, thinking about 
based on what we know about compute, about data, about algorithms, when might we expect, for example, uh, artificial general in intelligence to arise? What can we, what can we say ba specifically based on thinking about compute here? So it's an, like a question which many people are thinking about, just like, well, when is this, this artificial general intelligence, transformative intelligence, human level, whatever you name it, right? And I think there we already go into the details. I think it's like really important for people to actually say what they mean with these kinds of terms um, and not just say like, oh, my AGI timelines are X, Y, Z. Independent of that, some reports are trying to operationalize this and trying to forecast this and figure out when this is happening, right? And compute just plays an important role there. I just tried to describe the AI production function where I was like, well, we have these inputs, then we have like this AI production function and we get certain outputs. And now I'm asking, when is this output in AGI? What does this mean about my inputs, right? And I think there are like two famous apprentices. There's um, ways of like trying to do about it. I think one of them is like actually from AGI Cotra, which is this biological anchors report, which was, I think, on this podcast here before. And this is actually also to something like a compute centric framework where she's actively asking us like, well, if I would need to rerun evolution, how much compute is this? How much floating point operations is this? If I need to rerun the childhood development, how much compute is this? So we have like these different compute milestones, right? And what she then do, tries to do as the next step is like, we have this compute milestones. We're like, well, if I have a deep learning model, which roughly uses as much compute as these milestones, it might have similar capabilities, right? And then she actually tries to forecast like, compute available in a given year. And then you try to figure out like, well, what is the price performance of compute? This is like roughly looking to Moore's law, right? How many chips will be produced? How many flops can they calculate? And then you also look into how much you're willing to spend, right? It's an important question where it's like, well, do I actually want to spend that much money on doing this one training run to achieve a certain milestone? And the last thing is um, you need to adapt this to some type of algorithmic efficiency, right? Over time, you achieve you need less compute to achieve the same capabilities, right? So like you discount it over time, and this is like what this is described as algorithmic efficiency. That's one way of thinking about it. And that's one way how compute and like compute forecasting feeds directly into trying to forecast transformative AI. Given that people use different uh, different definitions of, for example, human level AI or transformative AI or artificial general intelligence, is, is there something useful we can gain from aggregating predictions across a number of reports? Say that these reports use slightly different uh, definitions of, of what we're trying to, to predict. Will this introduce too much noise for us to say something useful? I think, I think it's still useful to just like maybe look at them and just see what different forecasts think. We should like, uh, like trying to think about are they actually trying to forecast the same and what are the different biases in play there? I think, I think it's like hard to just throw together a survey with this bioanchors report, right? But if you have like two empirical approaches, be it the bioanchors report and like maybe like another approach, um, I think it's fair to just like, for, like look at them, right? To so something where you do a survey of all the different methods and then you can weigh it to your own needs. Um, I think what I'm more interested in is like actually, well, it's cool to have like these, these timelines, you know, when is this thing going to happen or something? I'm excited about like the intermediate inputs to these kinds of systems, right? If somebody is just like thinking about AI timelines and is on the way to think about AI timelines, they figure out what is the growth of compute. This is important, right? Just for the things we've just discussed. For example, there's a guy like me who looks at the growth of compute. like, well, this looks interesting. Maybe you can do compute governance. Maybe you can use this node to eventually achieve something. So you figure out better timelines, but you have like also intermediate outputs, which are useful. And this is part of the big reason why I'm excited about AI timelines research. It's like there's a bunch of intermediate inputs um, to these kinds of models, which are useful. And again, for empirical models, it's like the BioAnchors report, there are way more of these intermediate inputs compared to a survey. In a survey, I'm like, all I have is like maybe the qualitative entry from like some researcher, but they tend to be vague. And most of the times you just get a number. So I don't know how, what credence to put on this. So in the process of trying to forecast transformative AI, we might learn something that will turn out to be super useful for us. Let's get the, your take on this whole issue. So based on all the reports you've read, based on you know, your deep dives into, into compute, how would you think about uh, when we might expect artificial general intelligence or transformative AI? For what it's worth, I don't think there's like something special about just like Leonard telling his timelines or his numbers or something. I think it like really depends. Um, more like the intermediate inputs are more interesting. Yeah, how would I describe my views on this? I do think there is a significant chance that AI turns out to be a big deal. You can define it as transformative AI, as AGI or something, right? I do think I have like a 50% chance, like within the next 20 years or so, there might be something what we might call an AGI or transformative AI, right? What do I mean by this? 
well, maybe can measure it on benchmarks. There's like this famous MMLU benchmark. It's like, yeah, there's something which like scores like 95% on this. Maybe this system would also like pass like a really long Turing test, but like somebody's like really drilling down on these systems. And maybe the system also wins like a math Olympiad. And also the system is like able to control a robot, you know, which takes care of my dishwashers. I think it's like a typical example. Need. So like these are ways how we try to operationalize this, for example, within, with an epoch, if we try to think about forecasting or timelines. And like if I try to take this operationalization, I was like, yeah, I guess within the next 20 years, there's like a 50% chance of this happening. And then I have a really long tail, right? If it's like not happening soon, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe there's like some magic sauce to this. So it just really yeah it just will take a longer time we need to reinvent like the the whole thing again to eventually to get to agi do you think robotics is in the same category as more cognitive labor performed by ai it seems to me just looking at the landscape that we're making amazing amazing we have amazing developments in what you could call cognitive tasks but less progress in robotics so if if we define agi or transformative ai to include robotics that might significantly delay our prediction of when it will arrive it's it's like actually part of the key thing i was like man may, maybe maybe we have like those really smart systems that can do all of these things but like it just got really bad hands right um and me as as like active electric engineer who did like some robotics i was like it's really disappointing how like how slow progress is there it's still progress don't get me wrong right if you look i think everybody here watches like sometimes like these boston dynamics videos right you see those robots doing crazy stuff but there's just like still moving physical things. Our hands are like pretty, pretty good on a bunch of stuff. And it turns out this is really, really hard to get this on a computer. So I'm pretty confident there will be like, there might be right now a system which knows how to clean up my dishwasher and it might know how to do it really efficiently. But just like the sensitivity or like the logistics of moving your hands fast enough and like precise enough, it's just going to be like a really hard thing. I actually think like robotics is like a thing which people just sometimes anchor on too much, where they just think about like, oh, AI is only dangerous if it if it can move or has legs or something. Where it's like, no, actually our life is like so digital anyways. Most of our critical infrastructure is controlled by computing systems. You don't need hands to do a bunch of stuff, right? Us having this conversation right now has nothing to do with us having physical hands. This could happen completely by us being <laughs> AI simulated and this whole conversation being made up. True, true. Okay, so how much do you think robotics depends on compute? Is there a is there a compute bottleneck that's holding robotics back, or is it simply, or not simply, but is it is it more about designing uh, accurate hands or accurate sensors or or something else? Yeah, I think I think it's mostly about the latter. So, like, funny enough, like if if I say like today's systems use more and more compute, you also have the problem like these systems are big, right? Deep learning, big systems, billions of parameters. If you want them run to run them locally, you sometimes can't because they're just too big. They're too computation intensive. So if I just put like a GPT-4 in a Boston Dynamics roboter, this thing is going to be out of battery kind of, kind of quickly because you just need like four A100s to like run the system at a speed which is good enough. So this is what we've seen like from a paper from Google where it's like, yeah, we had like this really small model because yeah, we couldn't use a bigger model, right? And I guess like most, most of the stuff still boils down to just like how good are robotics hands and these kinds of stuff. You would be good enough at controlling it, but you're simply not sensitive enough and like precise enough with these hands. I do expect AI can help on this. Just AI can accelerate research. There are some researchers right now how to make better robotic hands, how to build better robots in general. They now use AI tools to summarize their research or maybe the AI tools to bring some new ideas and maybe new ideas come along. Maybe in the future, we even have AI systems which have like, completely new ideas how we will be building robots right looks like evolution figured it out looks like evolution figured out good movement way earlier than good brains right we could walk before we i mean probably not walking but at least crawl and like jump from tree to tree before we could like actually think really well so maybe we have some reason to believe there's actually not such a hard problem i'm like i think i'm generally like a bit confused why we haven't figured it out yet Maybe we have an option of simulating physical environments and learning how to do robotics in simulation before deploying them. And th that, uh, I think, would, would uh, make our robotics pro progress more dependent on compute. So if we could run huge simulations, these simulations would be extremely uh, computationally intensive. But that, that is a possible path forward. I don't know whether that actually gets us all the way there to real world a robotic interaction. Did, what, what do you think about this? Do, do you have any insight here? It seems right. Definitely can help with this. I think we generally have to form like, like this sim to real. Just like, yeah, like our simulations are complex, but you've seen reality, Oof, it's even more complex. And I, I guess this will just continue being like some kind of barrier. 
Um, and like, yeah, I'm definitely excited of people trying to think more about this. Like, how how would this actually translate? You know, if I have this robot moving in my simulation, can I actually actually also move in the world? Right? It might be easier for your Roomba, you know, which is like driving around and technically only has like a two D space. But like a walking robot with legs seems way harder. Yeah. Okay. So we we talked about the we talked about the AI triad of of data algorithms and compute and. Perhaps one useful thing here is to talk about how these can be traded off against each other, um, because this might tell us something about how important compute is. So what, what do you think, for example, if we had the perfect data set, how much would this mean in terms of AI progress? Uh, combine combine the, the perfect data set with the compute and algorithms available today. Yeah, I, I would love to know the answer to this, just like <laughs> what is the perfect data set? One thing we've yeah like ran into when we like try to collect just like what are the data trends how much that we've been using just like what are actually the different dimensions of data right i can measure data just like how many data points how many tokens how many pictures how many gigabyte but we all know there's a different quality in data right and now we get into the tricky things like well how do we measure quality right um on these types of data one thing how you can see just like the data quality matters if you for example i think it was a chinchilla paper which is a paper by DeepMind. So you have a big data of text, right? And then you train the system on this text. And usually it only gets to see the, the text only once. It only has like one epoch per text. But interesting enough, for example, for um, given Chinchilla that it needed a lot of data because they found new scaling laws, they actually did run twice about the Wikipedia te text. It was like, well, Wikipedia is like really great text. You know, it's like really high quality data. It's like maybe closer to the truth than just Reddit or like a bunch of other stuff on the internet. So let's train the system twice on this because it's better. And we have like good reasons to believe if we look at humans that actually like data efficiency can be way better. I'm claiming I'm more data efficient than GPT-4, at least for the moment. Um, I don't need to, I mean, I haven't read as much, but you know, and, and some things I can maybe outpace GPT-4. Um, so there's lots to gain there. And if you use less data, um, this also means we have like smaller training runs to some degree, right? Unless we just show the data way more times. So like, it's not clear how it directly translate, but in general means like, more high quality data probably is useful, probably better than low quality data. I don't know how much better. And less data means also less compute for these kinds of systems. So I think there's definitely progress to be made over time. And I think this is also partially where we've seen where we've seen progress over time, right? If you just had better data when more better data became available. So my impression is that we are actually using something close to all the data available online to train the biggest models. Is that also your impression? Do you think that's true, that we are, we are reaching limits of, of how much data we, we have available online? Yeah, um, it's not like, I think there's more data. So we, we try to look into this and like, try to be like, well, how much more text data is out there? And you, you start becoming a bit creative, right? Like, oh, like we, we don't produce text data right now, we produce voice data. But guess what? We can run another AI system on this to produce more text data. Cool. I don't think I don't think this podcast is, is the thing that should, I mean, maybe that's the thing they should be training on. I don't know. But there is YouTube out there. Let's just take all the YouTube videos in the world. Let's transcribe them. Here we go. We have way more text. Is this high quality data? Probably not. Most of it is just like, probably not that good. Some of it might be better, right? Like some pretty good podcasts out there. So there's like more data to be acquired. And we try to forecast just like how much videos are getting produced. If we like transcribe then, how much my data do we get out of this? And then we were like thinking, we're like looking at it's like, well, it looks like at some point we might run out of data, just not for the simple reason. There is lots of it out there. Don't get me wrong. But we're also just using lots of it. And we try to predict this then with like scaling laws, which is like this thing which describes well, we have a network of this size, how much data do we need and how much compute do we need to train it like pretty much optimal. And it's unclear if these scaling laws can continue to the scale, which we discovered there. But there's definitely a thing where you might lack high quality data. And I think right now, I think reinforcement learning from human feedback is already such an example. It's like actually quality matters. Yeah? You know, like this human feedback is like actually way more useful than training your on like a bunch of scrappy data on the internet. So I think I'm more interested in just like, there is more data out there, but you want to get high quality data. How do you get more high quality data for the things you actually care about, for the things you actually want to do? Yeah. So when when I've played around with uh, GPT four, uh, for example, some of the uh, some of the output text is very clever, and uh, you we we might be tempted to use that output text to train new language models. This sounds like some kind of Ponzi scheme or some kind of magic where we make up data out of thin air. Do you think that would work? Do you think, do you think uh, output from, from previous language models would be interesting as training data for new language models? 
I don't know if it will work. I think my guess is just like somebody will like figure this out because the incentives are definitely there because here we go. This is just like the easiest way for us to like acquire more data. And I guess companies will look into this. Um, I'm personally probably not excited about it. I was like, ah, AI systems feeding into AI systems. I don't know. I think this is like how failure could look like. You know, you just have like these loops of AI systems. We have like barely an idea where it did go wrong, right? Now we have like this two layered black boxes. Well, congrats. <laughs> now we make it even harder to understand everything. So I guess I would definitely go for this. Yeah, trying to use this synthetic data to something you just like trying to make it up. But also just like maybe have like, I mean, I think maybe an example is like actually this this Llama model, which came out of Matter, and then Stanford made alpaca out of it, right? And I think if I understand it correctly, correctly, they like fine tune it based on feedback from ChatGPT. Here we go, already an example. You don't need human labor anymore. You can skip your Amazon Turkers. You just use ChatGPT. It's way cheaper. Turns out it was like cheap, pretty good, and this model is like performing really well. So I expect that at least for fine tuning, it will be useful. But I think we should like really be cautious there. And just like, again, black boxes feeding into black boxes, I think is not an ideal scheme from my lens who wants to understand these systems and make sure they're actually, yeah, well understood. What about trading off algorithmic progress uh, against uh, data or, or compute? So, so imagine if we had optimal algorithms, how much would this matter? For example, I, I saw a DeepMind recently made a, an advance in uh, algorithmic uh, matrix multiplication, I believe, which is kind of a core process of machine learning. How much does this matter? Could this make, say, compute less relevant because algorithms would be so efficient that they would need less compute to run? There, there's definitely history. I think it's just like, I mean, if we go back to the AI trend, algorithms is one thing. And the question is like, well, how have algorithmic efficiency developed over time? The problem is just like, it's really hard to measure. And the best ways of measuring it is right now we look at the benchmark, which we use in this case, um, people used ImageNet and looked at it and it's like, well, how much compute do I need to achieve the capability X on this benchmark over time? And what we historically seen there, the compute used is halving, I think every nine to one year. Right? So like in a year from now, I can achieve the same capability right now for half of the compute of the previous system which achieves this capability. That's a big deal, right? But again, compute trends have been like a bit faster, right? Because eventually it's not about achieving capability X, it's about like you want to keep on pushing the frontier, right? I think just like every percentage point of accuracy, every percentage point of like better capabilities is actually useful because we're now entering this new era where we're actually trying to make money out of these systems. And sometimes single digit percent points just matter. It's just the difference between we all have autonomous cars or we don't have any autonomous cars right now. But it's like, yep, we have like really high standards for these kinds of systems. So algorithmic efficiency definitely reduces the compute you use. The question is like, where do we continue pushing our AI systems? And historically, we've seen just like bigger and bigger systems. And then you have like better gains due to algorithmic efficiency, but also due to because we just throw more compute at the problem, more data. Okay, let's let's. You have this graph with different eras of compute usage in machine learning systems. Um, where starting with the the pre deep learning era, then the deep learning, and then large scale systems. Could try to describe this graph for us. What what what's the key lessons from this? Yeah, so th this is coming from our papers, uh, three eras of machine of compute usage in machine learning, or something along these lines. Um, so like the key thing is what we looked at is like we looked at training compute, which we've just discussed and trying to figure out like how this has been developing over time. And before the time, we mean, I think we started in 1958 or something, like when like the first advantage of AI has been happening. And this is what we call the pre-deep learning area. The deep learning area roughly emerged in 2010 to 2012. And within this area, we roughly see the training compute is doubling every two years. This reminds of us another law, which might a lot of people might know, which is called Moore's law. Um, Moore's law exactly describes the trans uh, transistor density on chips, but I think in this case, we can just roughly say, well, the price performance doubles every two years. You know, every two years you get a chip, which is you know, twice as good for the same price. This basically means in this pre-deep learning area, people just always spend like a constant budget on, on training these systems, you know, like maybe this constant budget was just like, yep, the CPU, the processor, which was like right at this desk of this researcher. But at some point in 2010, 2012, the deep learning area emerged, right? Famously, with LXNet, maybe with our systems before, they did one new thing. They used GPUs, graphics processing units, which are really, really good at computation of parallel problems at matrix multiplication, right? Which is the key thing which we do for training these AI systems. And with this era, we basically see like, wow, people are starting building bigger and bigger systems, deeper systems, right? Deep learning, that's what we do here. And the compute growth just like skyrocket, right? And I think this is like, it's really important. It's like doubling every six months, right? From 2010 to 2012. 
that's a big deal, right? If you double something for six months, this cannot go on forever. Let's talk about this question of, of whether this can go on because so far we've talked about, you know, companies now reaching three nanometers, uh, which is extremely tiny, probably close to the physical limits. Uh, you, you tell me, uh, what, what does this mean? Uh, are we running out of possibility to create uh, denser computer chips? Yeah, let, let, let's take a step back and just like, well, computers doubling every six months, can this go on forever? So what I've just, I think, yeah, when we do, when we say like, we spend more compute on these systems, what are the factors which enable us to spend more compute on these systems? Well, it looks like computers get better over time. How much better do they get over time? I think Moore's law says they double every two years. Um, a recent investigation by my colleagues Tamai and Marius looked at the price performance of GPUs and they roughly found, well, the price performance doubles every 2.5 years, right? So every 2.5 years, you get double the amount of floating point operations for the same cost. When compute then doubles every six months, this basically means we just spend more money. That's what we do, right? We spend more money on the system and it looks like people did it because it paid off with the capabilities. There are limits to how much money we can spend if something doubles like every six months. So if you crunch the numbers and you roughly assume like, hey, it's doubling every six months and price performance halves like every 2.5 years, so this buys you more over time. At some point you hit like you spend 1% of the US GDP or you spend like similar amounts as the Apollo project on these kinds of training systems. Is this likely? I don't know. It depends what the economic return is of these systems. Are people actually incentivized to do this? Um, it depends if we actually have so much compute out there. You know, do we have data centers that are actually big enough that you just like can burn so much money? It's not like if I wave with money, immediately compute appears. M maybe a couple of years later it appears if I wave with the money. And as you said, well, I've just been saying like way price performance um, has been like halving uh, every 2.5 years or like doubling every 2.5 years. We'll just continue, right? And and now we get into the weeds where just like, Every electric engineer hates you for this. I'm like, well, will Moore's law continue? Is this actually true? I'm just like, man, I don't care about Moore's law. I care about just like price performance. Will it continue? Um, my rough guess is just like, yeah, there are roadmaps out there. I think we're like probably at least fine for another five years of making transistors smaller. You're right. At some point, we we hit like new barriers, just like how small we can these transistors make. But great to us, yeah, like human intuitivity, it's been great. We've just like continue doing this. We throw exponential more money out at this, but we also get exponential more gains. So I guess. There is more to, to do there. But even, even if Moore's law stops, I think that's like an important concept to understand is right now we have this really short R&D cycles. People want a new iPhone every year, right? Every year we want a new processor. So your R&D spending for these chips is immense. If instead we have like longer R&D cycles, this means we spend more money of developing this, we might have better economies of scale. So while your performance per chip stays the same, you can sell the same chip over five years compared to usually one year. So we might see better economy of scale. So the performance stays the same, but the price might drop, which then eventually means the price performance might continue to yeah, go up over time that you just get more for your money. Um, but yeah, key question for people to figure out what's going on there. Really hard question because you're just trying to forecast basically yeah, to something to the future of humanity, the future of computing. And historically, I mean, Moore's Law was pretty good at this. I don't know about the other forecasts on this. Do you think there's some other paradigm coming after this, this continual hunt or continual attempt to try to squeeze more and more transistors onto a chip? Do you think there's some, you know, some quantum phenomena or some 3D computing? Or is, is there anything you could see as an interesting uh, air to, to the present paradigm? Yeah, I guess there will be like, in the beginning, we'll have like hybrid approaches or something, right? It was like, well, our chips, you know, like they're like, we're hitting the limits of small we can make, but maybe we can stack them. Maybe you can just like put them all together. Or like what Apple did with the M1 Ultra. It's like, well, we only can make a chip this big, but what if we just put them next to each other with like a high performance interconnect? Or like what AMD is currently is like, well, we chips only get this good, but let's just put four next to each other and like try to connect them. So like there's like a bunch of hybrid mechanisms of like how you're trying to work your way around this, right? Putting more chips next to each other doesn't sound to me like the same kind of progress as making transistors smaller and fitting more of, of them on a chip. That seems right. It's definitely it's definitely a different different out of progress there. But like I think what I'm saying is like, yeah, uh, there are like different ways around this. And there's like one way how you use hybrid techniques or like new techniques. And the other way is like people start thinking of, about completely new computing paradigms, right? Like in the beginning, we had like those big relays and then eventually moved to integrated circuits. And while well, integrated circuits have been powering us for like the last 60 years or something or like 80 or something, the question is like, what's next? Yeah, you mentioned quantum computing. I'm not an expert on this. Whenever I talk to people, like, I 
probably it's overhyped as everything. Um, and even like, I think it's, diff it's trying to solve different problems there, but I guess I'm the wrong person to talk there. What else is out there? There's something like neuromorphic computing, like more like analog computing is brain inspired computing. I expect us to make like more progress there. And this is particularly interesting when you think about AI cases. My rough guess right now is like at least the things which I've seen, it's pretty interesting for inference, but not for training systems yet. And I also don't know, my other thing is like, this is still processed on silicon. I just don't know if you need cutting edge chips, right? Um, I would rather call it like to some degree, it's like design innovation. You produce different types of chips, but it's still silicon chips. And other things which are the optical computing, I have no clue about optical computing, if this is promising or not. People will like figure this out over time and at some point it might become cost competitive. I'm pretty bullish that it's not going to be happening in the next eight to 10 years or something. But then ask me again and we can see where we are. So to what extent, if we're trying to predict what's going to happen with AI progress based on compute, how much should we take into account these kind of wild cards or, or black swan events or whatever you want to call it, where suddenly perhaps we get a, a much more intense uh, progress in compute based on something like you know optical computing or quantum computing or something that, that an advance that we hadn't anticipated, an advance that's not part of the trend line that we're extrapolating. We should take an account. I would like put relatively low probability on this. It's, it's not like the case. Nobody is trying right now to just build a better processor, right? There's money to be made. If you figure out like something better than what TSMC is doing and you to replace this billion dollar industry with something cheaper, which you can build in your garage, here we go. I think you just, you just won the lottery. Congrats. I think a bunch of people are trying this. The same goes for algorithmic innovation, everything around computation. Eventually, I think a bunch of stuff just boils down to just like this, this exponential growth or like some kind of growth. Maybe I'm just the economist here like, yep, it's always 3% GDP growth. You know, that's, that's always the thing. That's always what's been happening. I was like, yep, it's always Moore's law. It's just like this, the self-fulfilling thing, um, thing, which you're like um, trying to do. So do I put a lot of probabilities on these kinds of events? Most of the time not, because I care about like price performance. You might tell me like, well, it's not going to be a flop in the future. It might be something else. It might be light bending, whatever. I was like, yeah, it might be the case. But eventually what it, like, I care about the output or something, right? That's the thing we, we got to look out for there. I'm probably compared, if we look at the eye trend, like, do I expect like major breakthroughs in like better computing performance? Probably not. Do I expect major breakthroughs for algorithms? Yeah, I have like a higher probability there because we have systems like our brain where I was like... There, there is some good algorithm out there, you know, it's like it's running here right now and it's pretty energy efficient and it's more energy efficient than GPT-4. So I'm like, there is something out there, right? It's physically possible. There, there I have some proof. So I have like higher probability that these kinds of things might be happening. Tell us the difference between AI timeline forecasting and AI takeoff speeds. Um, with timelines we're trying to usually, I mean, sometimes people just say one year, but we're trying to figure out like the time and point when Transformative AI, AGI, whatever you want to define is emerging. So it's a point in time. And usually people try to put like uh, probabilities on this, right? There's like some kind of normal distribution around this or some kind of distribution around this. Whereas takeoff speeds is a time duration where people are asking like, how long does it take to go from A to B? And then we already start getting to the weeds. How do you define eventually A to B? One way how to go about this is just like, what a recent report by Tom Davidson tried to do is they think about just like, when can we automate most of human labor in the world, like most cognitive tasks or something. It's like, well, takeoff is, and I'm not sure if it's exactly these numbers, but something like from 20% to 100% of like having all human cognitive or like I think all human labor um, eventually automated. Other people think about takeoff differently. Others are just like, well, takeoff is the thing from the first artificial general intelligence defined by some metrics to the point where this thing is going to take over the world. Something along these lines. So like takeoff just always comes to the duration from A to B and what these A's and B's are. Everybody has like different ideas there. And I think all of them are like somewhat useful, but all of these models end up looking different. And some of these models are more tractable. Some of the models are just way harder. Yeah, we, we could have two people with the same AI timelines say that they predict uh, AGI by uh, 2050, but different AI takeoff speed uh, predictions say that one person predicts that uh, we will have a slow takeoff, say that we will have uh, progress beginning in the 2030s and, and being steady all the way up to 2050. Or another person predicting that we will have uh, much slower progress until 2048, from which we will have extreme, uh, extreme progress. So that's, that's kind of the, the difference we have there. Is there anything to learn from studying compute specifically about takeoff speeds? And here I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, this is just my 
kind of uneducated guess that if we know something about the compute, how computers is produced and what, how much compute is available, this puts an, a limit to how fast a takeoff we could have. Do you think there's something to that? Uh, absolutely. I think there's something to it, right? We just like look at compute, just like what does it matter for takeoff? Um, mm -hmm. We might have discussed a bit of scale, like maybe we can go back to the bio anchors model. You might be saying, well, takeoff is from the childhood milestone to the evolution milestone, right? Because they both describe the amount of labor you can automate or something. Then both of them are defined by compute. Here we go. Compute is useful. I think where it's more interesting to just like actually look at the compute as a limiting factor for takeoff, right? We need to deploy the systems. We need to train more systems. So do we actually have enough compute for this? Right? A lot of people are just like, well, if current threats continue and we have like another 10 years of, of this progress, we use this much compute. I'm asking like, well, do we actually have so much compute? Like how much chips is TSMC actually producing? So the production capabilities of like fabs, how much chips are going to be out there, just, just matter for these types of questions. It also just matters like, what about other things? Like at the moment, TSMC is like mostly producing like chips for MacBooks, for smartphones and AI chips, like just only a small minority of these chips. Will AI be economically important enough? Will people believe this, that they actually re-steer and produce less smartphones and more AI accelerators? Or will we just build more fabs? And there are limits to this, right? If like the US is trying to do build fabs right now, it just takes a long time and it's just really, really hard and just costs a lot of money. And all these kinds of things eventually can then inform how do you feel about takeoff and just like compute being a bottleneck there, right? And not too important, like important geopolitical events, right? If you don't have access to compute, or if you think about TSMC, which is sitting in Taiwan and there is a China-Taiwan invasion, this plays a really important role, just like how many AI chips are out there? Are they accessible? And this then feeds into just like, are we actually doing these large training runs? Are we actually running enough AI models? So we have like some some yeah, certain percentages of the economy being automated. Perhaps a, a very fast takeoff would require something that we haven't seen before in terms of algorithmic efficiency um, for it to overcome this, this bottleneck of, of compute. We, we talked about what we can learn from trying to forecast AI progress, uh, because it, it might seem like a, a sort of, you know, whether, whether we have transformative AI by 2050 or 2055, I don't know how much that matters, but you talked about how we can, how, how there are important insights to be gained from studying, from, from trying to forecast AI. And the thing you've landed on is just the importance of compute. So, so perhaps you could uh, here introduce this notion of uh, compute governance that you've landed on. Yeah. I mean, as you just said, like compute is one of these inputs and like, I learned like, well, it looks like an important input. Um, what can we do? Um, what is my definition of compute governance? So like when we go back to this AI production function, we have like these inputs, we have algorithms, data and compute. And my claim is, well, if I, if I wiggle this compute node, I can, I can do something about like AI down here, like the deployment of AI systems, the training of AI systems, eventually also this being used in a beneficial way. That's like, that's a rough claim. That's what I describe as compute governance. What the outcomes are, there are various different things you can eventually achieve with this. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Fantastic.